Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first official webinar event from our UC Press First Gen program, which UC Press is hosting in partnership with the UC Collaborative of Humanities Centers and Institutes. I'm Teresa Ayafola, and I'm the UC Press Author Marketing Communications Manager, and I've been leading the development <clears throat> of our First Gen program. I also want to introduce our co-host, Judy Su Chen Wu, who is the director of the UCI Humanities Center, as well as the current chair of our editorial committee <clears throat> and the professor of Asian American Studies at UC Irvine. Thank you so much, Teresa. And thanks to all of you who are joining us. We're so excited to see the numbers of people who register and express interest. And it shows what a need that we're trying to fulfill through this particular program. Um, so I just want to say a couple of words from my, from my two hats. One is um, serving as the chair of the editorial committee for UC Press. I'm so proud to be affiliated with the press. The press published my first book. And as I've worked with the press for the last four years, I've just become much more aware of the social justice mission of the press. The press is interested in publishing first rate, cutting edge scholarship and the scholarship that takes on um, pressing social issues that address social inequality. Um, so I really appreciate Teresa for spearheading the First Gen Initiative. And I think it's indicative of what UC Press stands for. The other hat that I'm wearing is director of the UCI Humanity Center. I think for many people, the um, academy, the humanities in particular, have a perception of being an ivory tower, a place of isolated scholarship generation, um, and perhaps more generally, the sense of being a gatekeeper. Um, and what I think I try to do and my siblings centers and institutions across the UCs try to do is to actually create a pathway. We're here to help find support for our faculty, our students. We wanna help them foster a sense of intellectual community. We wanna celebrate the work that they do. Um, and so I think this event today is particularly appropriate um, and emblematic of what we do collectively within the UCs, both as presses and as humanities centers and institutes. And I think that, that mission or ethos is really captured by this idea of a research justice university. So I'm gonna turn this over um, to our wonderful panel um, and I'm looking forward to um, people's comments and, and um, wisdom. I'm gonna quickly um, make a quick comment just about our first gen uh, program. Thank you so much, Judy, um, for that intro. So, and we're very grateful to have a really exciting lineup of panelists for you all today. Um, so just to, I'll keep this very brief. Uh, as I mentioned, this is our first official event um, with U, of UC Press's First Gen program, which we launched this past fall. So the aim of our new program is to, as, as Judy kind of said, improve equity in book publishing by cultivating publishing and promoting the work of First Gen scholars. Uh, and through, we're doing this through a variety of efforts. So the first thing is where um, we are providing financial support to first-gen scholars whose book projects are both a good fit for our list and have been accepted for publication at UC Press. So in other words, anyone interested, if anyone in the audience is interested, um, you will need to submit a book proposal that is a good fit for one of our editors lists. Because our funds are limited, we're not providing financial support for projects that don't fit our existing publishing program. So our program also include, will include events like this one um, to help demystify the book publishing process and also provide opportunities to network with the community. We of course wish that we could have one-on-one -on -one sessions with each and every one of you, but unfortunately time is limited. So we're focusing instead on webinars and workshops where we can reach as many people as possible. We'll also be providing online resources about the publishing process, data from the research phase of our program, which actually is already posted online on our website if you haven't already seen it. Um, and we have started a first-gen email list where we'll share monthly updates from the program as well as additional resources. And I will drop a link um, in the chat where you can see some of those uh, resources. So then just very quickly, housekeeping items. First, we will be sharing a recording of the webinar with everyone next week. So for anyone who can't stay or would like to reference it later, don't worry, we will send that out. And then in terms of our schedule today, the first part of our webinar, the first hour, we have our panel with um, several first-gen scholars and book authors who so all can hear about their experience and their advice. Um, and we'll follow that with a short Q&A. 
we'll have a very brief break and then transition to our second part, which will feature presentations from several of our UC Press editors um, about sp specific aspects of publishing, and then follow that with a Q&A. So please, uh, we encourage you to drop questions in that Q&A box at the bottom um, during for the Q&A portions, but you can also put questions in there throughout the webinar and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. So with that, I will hand the mic over to Long who will moderate our first gen author panel. Thank you so much for that. So I'm Long Bui. I'm associate professor of global and international studies at UC Irvine. At UC Irvine, I'm also the director of the first gen faculty initiatives on the campus where I spearhead many first gen initiatives. I'm very happy to be here with UC Press and talk to our great panelists today. I'm gonna to briefly just go over their bios in terms of their publication of books. You can look at their extensive bios on their faculty profiles. So first is Dr. Anita Casavanes Bradford is a full professor in history and Chicano Latino studies. Dr. Bradford investigated the politics of childhood in the transnational Cuban and forthcoming book entitled Suffer Children, Unaccompanied Child Migrants and the Geopolitics of Compassion in Post-War America, which also comes out with the University of North Carolina Press. Ma Vang is a associate professor of critical race and ethics studies at the University of California Merced. Her book, History on the Run, Secrecy, Kuchiri, and Hmong Refugee Epistemologies came out with Duke University Press last year and examines how secrecy structures both official knowledge and refugee epistemologies. Mohamed Abumaye is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Cal State uh, University of San Marcos. His forthcoming book is titled The Black Muslim Refugee, Militarism, Policing, and Somali Refugee Resistance to Police Violence. All right, so I'm gonna start with a question that's just personal, cause you know, we're here about first gen. The question to all the panelists is a challenge for first gen scholars can be imposter syndrome and struggling to feel like you belong or don't belong in academy. Can you briefly talk about your experience when it comes to book publishing and what helped you through just the publishing world of academic writing and research? Anyone can start if a thought jumps out at them. I will call on <laughs> Mohammed. Okay, Anita, okay, yes. I can, I can go if you like. Yes. Mm -hmm. First of all, Hi, all thousand of you, what an amazing turnout. <laughs> I hope that, that many of you are also first-gen scholars or scholars in the making. Um, the Academy needs us, so glad you're here. Um, imposter syndrome's a real thing. Um, I still feel it every day. And um, Long is very kind. I'm, I'm not quite to full yet. I'm under review for full, so will be a full professor by the end of this academic year, um, God willing. Um, but, you know, this far along in my career, I still feel it. If you feel it, it's normal. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean you don't belong in the academy. Um, we just feel it, don't we? Um, in terms of actual book publishing and what helped me through, I would have to say mentorship and relationships, right? So my, my first book was published primarily through a series of happy accidents. Um, in that I joined a small research community, the UC Cuba uh, Multi-Campus Academic Initiative. It's a University of California program that brings all of our campuses together, faculty, grad students that do research on Gua. And in my first year as a grad student, I joined that incredibly supportive community and presented my work there. Um, had mentorship from a dear senior faculty colleague, Professor Raul Fernandez, also a first-gen scholar um, like myself of Cuban background. And, you know, they, they nurtured my dissertation. And by the time I finished my PhD with, with dissertation in hand, and I imagined that I would then need to spend the next five years writing and rewriting and doing all of this stuff to make my work good enough, um, Professor Fernandez told me, no, you're, this is a book already. And send it out and let the press evaluate it and tell you what needs to be done. If there's further work to be done on it, do the work that the press tells you to do. Don't just invent for yourself a list of things that need to be done. 
um, you've never published a book you don't know, right? And so he basically guided me, introduced me to um, a editor at the University of North Carolina Press, which is a leading press in my field, and said, email this person, share an abstract of the book, ask them if they would be willing to talk to you about it more. Um, and that gave me the confidence to send an initial email and say, hi, my project is about this. Would you be interested in talking more? Uh, the response that I got was, yes, send us the manuscript now. And I sent it in. And two weeks later, they said, we're sending this out to external reviewers. And I officially began the process of external review. Um, had I not had that encouragement from a supportive mentor, I probably would have spent the first three or four years of my assistant professorship doing rewrites that I thought were necessary rather than the ones that in fact were necessary. So the lesson, the takeaway there for me is make sure you belong to supportive small groups of scholars, preferably with some senior scholars who know the book publishing process well, um, and, and let them guide you. And when they tell you that your work is good, believe that they know better than you do and be confident and send your work out. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Vanita. You actually answer questions about mentorship and editorial advice. So uh, Mohammed and Ma, do you have tips on navigating the imposter syndrome and how to find mentorship and community? Mohammed, you were gonna talk earlier, but also I'll let you go. Okay, thanks Ma. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, you know, I really appreciate the comments that, that Anita made. I think that was really useful um, and wish I had heard them earlier as well. Um, you know, I, I think in, I still uh, agree, uh, experience imposter syndrome, um, and not just with publishing a book, with writing in general, right? Um, uh, a, a, mode, a mode of, you know, transmitting knowledge that in, in many ways um, can be and is to some extent Eurocentric, right? Um, you know, I came from this country, uh, from Somalia, as, as a refugee, um, you know, went to under-resourced high schools where we got no writing skills, right? The most we wrote in high school was like a two-paragraph essay. And I was like, how can you write two paragraphs? That's just, that's so much to say, you know, and you were given. And so I think for me, it was always struggling with that throughout my college experience. And just, you know, to echo what Anita said, it was really having mentors that believe in you and then believe that you have something important to say. And for me, I think um, that was really Yen, uh, my mentor and advisor who really pushed forward home that, you know, we have something important to say. And, you know, and for me, reading all these books written by, about the Somali refugee experience by people who were not Somalis, uh, predominantly white, right? Who didn't live through the war or the refugee camps, but were taking sort of um, authoritative approaches to that and you know and you know for many of us in the community it's like you don't really know what happened and what it was like and what it felt to live through that and so I think you know getting the mentorship of Yen um, and getting that feedback right uh, was really critical but I think for me to also overcome the imposter syndrome what was really helpful was you know I'm writing about the Somali refugee community right and always you know in back of my mind is I do want to publish with UC Press, but who am I hope ultimately being held accountable for? And it is people in the community who are fighting and surviving and struggling every day to build a better world for themselves against the themes that I address, such as police violence and US militarism. So, you know, I share uh, chapter drafts um, with people in the community and, and receives tremendous support while also till, still trying to speak to uh, the broader academic audience, right? And I think that's where, you know, Yen and other mentors have been helpful is that, these are the tools that you need, right? That you have important things to say, but you still have to speak within this language. You still have to, you know, speak to the broader field and the broader discipline and, and what it's saying. And I think that's really what's helped me through both imposter syndrome and writing is to remember who I'm writing for, um, but, but also getting the mentorship and feedback um, uh, from my advisors and, and colleagues as well. Um. I'm so excited to be a part of this panel and, and um, to have so many people join us. Hi, everyone. So, you know, I have similar thoughts and comments to Anita and, and Muhammad about imposter, imposter syndrome and sort of how to navigate this. 
Um, I still don't think I navigate it well, right? Um, because it's a lot of it is uh, um, trying out something and it doesn't work and then figuring out, okay, what do I do next, right? Um, I'll just list a couple of the imposter syndrome feelings that I had. And so we'll see if this resonates with some of you, but you know, um, thoughts about, you know, am I good enough? Are my idea, ideas good enough? Who is going to read this, right? And, and that comes from graduate school where we're trying to develop our research ideas and getting questions, um, and rightly so, from um, professors about, well, why is this important? Uh, you know, how can this be generalizable, right? So you have to be able to, to talk about those things and make your research um, applicable. And, and so then I felt like I really internalized um, those questions, right? That, um, and so then in the process of writing, of course, the dissertation and then thinking and then the book, uh, those questions kept coming up for me. Um, and, and then beyond that, as, as Mohammed mentioned, you know, just the mechanics of writing itself, right? Uh, uh, English as a second language, you know, it's a it's a huge barrier to um, be able to express your thoughts and ideas in what seems like a linear fashion, even though we don't think of it in that way. So I, you know, I talk to my grad students about this all the time. It's like I know you're there's lots of ideas that you're working with, um, and going on in your head and you're also writing them down, but you know, but the challenge is to be able to write in a linear fashion so that, you know, in a way that someone reading it would understand, right? Uh, or would be able to follow your train of thought. And um, so for me, it's a process of trying to figure out, you know, how do I do that? How do I translate what I have in my, you know, head and, and in conversations with other people into something that is actually written, right? And, um, and so for me, that process didn't happen uh, where I sat down and wrote a whole chapter through, right? But I sat down and write chunks and pieces of it at a time. And some things that I thought were gonna belong in one chapter actually didn't, right? And so also letting go of, um, you know, because for, for someone like me as whose English is a second language that once I've written something down, it's hard for me to let it go, right? It's like, I did it, I wrote this, I can't delete it, I can't cut it out, <laughs> right? And so there's also that process of working through, okay, you know, this is also just writing, right? And it's, it doesn't work. So can I let it go? Can I move it somewhere else, right? So that's, that's um, those are all the different sort of barriers for me in particular. Um, and I had mentioned this in another session, a different session, but I have like up to 10 drafts of a chapter because I can't let things go, right? All the writing that I've done, I wanted it all to be in there, even though, though I knew it didn't work. Um, and so, uh, but, so those are the, the issues, right, for me in thinking about what does it mean to be, um, to be researching and then putting that research into writing um, and then to be in conversation with, with other people. Um, and in terms of support uh, for that, um, getting, you know, once I got out of grad school, I did a two-year postdoc and, like I went in a different, it took me longer, right? Because then there were more things to, that I thought that I needed to, to write and to say. And you know, to Anita's point earlier about sort of inventing things that you think that you need to write about, I, I kind of went down that path, right? And part of it is that I felt for me, I'm writing, I also put a lot uh, of pressure into what the book could look like because I felt like my book would be, and I wanted my book to be um, a, an important book for folks to read and understand 
Hmong Americans and Hmong refugee experiences, because there's been so many, you know, in the in the limited published works that they are, those published texts are not always um, well-rounded, right? And in the ways in which they, they present a complex picture of this particular community. So I wanted that. And so that was an additional pressure um, to make the book to be more than just an academic book, right? I mean, of course, every academic book is not just an academic book, but there's so much more um, that I felt like I needed to have. And that became the added pressure and the added length of time that I went down and, and you know, create a lot more writing for myself because I felt like I needed to address as much as I could um, until I realized there's only so much I can say, right, in, in one book. Um, so those were all of the first gen issues um, that I had to deal with um, and, and work through and still working through. Okay, thank you for that, Ma. And then that segues to our next question, which is a two-parter, and that is about institutions and editor relationships. You know, we're part of institutions, and the question is, how do you find the resources and get the institutions that you're at to support you in your endeavors to publish that book? And also, how do you externally go out of your institution and look for these people, editors, and presses that you don't actually know intimately and build those relationships? All right, so we can start from last order again. It'll be Anita. Do you want to start again? Um, sure. So going back to what I what I had talked about earlier and the role that UC Cuba played in my own scholarly path, right? I think one of the most important things that you can do is find your small scholarly community. And I, and I really want to emphasize that that is often not your advisor. Um, the experience of many URM and first gen grad students is that they don't always find an advisor who is um, as supportive or is as competent in supporting them um, in the way that they would like, right? That's, that's a reality of academia um, that we hope will change as more first gen and scholars of color join the academy, right? In the interim, living in the space that we're in right now, we have to go looking for each other, right? So hopefully first gen and URM scholars are actively looking for students to support, but students don't wait, right? Find, um, find communities. And I would recommend, for example, that you look for small conferences um, or even better workshops. Workshops are even better than conferences because the understanding in a workshop environment is that you're going to share your work with one another um, that are focused on the topics or themes or methodologies or communities that you care about. Go to those events, participate there and introduce yourself to the faculty and to the grad students who are further ahead than you. Those people are going to be your sources of expertise and your liaison, your connection to the press, right? A cold reach out or contact to a press can be effective, but I would say it's much more effective to go through a mediator, right? Talk to a faculty member who has published who can tell you what should that first email sound like, can share an example of a book proposal with you, can even help you draft that first email, right? And sort of negotiate that process with you. And yeah, just to reemphasize, don't expect that it's going to be your advisor. I had two very good co-advisors, but they were Chicano men who were very interested in how my work about Cuban and Cuban American exiled childhoods related to broader sort of Latinx history and Chicano history, right? And then pushing me in that direction made me a better scholar. It made me comparative. It made me relational and I'm very grateful, but the specific kinds of mentorship that I needed to study and write about the politics of childhood in Cuba and to publish in a press that was interested in Cuba had to come from a specialized community, right? So find those communities and get in there. Even if you're an introvert like I am, you gotta go. <laughs> Great, thank you for that, Mohammed. Yeah, and, and I want to just, you know, again, strongly echo what Anita said. These are really important words. It's really just network 
and and put yourself out there, right? You might be at a conference and you know run into someone who's published with UC Press that can get you in contact, or you know run into an editor. And I think um, really expanding your community uh, beyond your department because you might be in a department with you know no one else besides you working in that specialized field, right? And getting into contact with other people that that are on you know that are working in your field that can sort of give you. Uh, feedback is 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 really um, um, instrumental, and I and again the second point is really important. You know, I, I work at a more teaching oriented institution, so there's very little resources and time for writing. And if you can, you know, join a writing workshops, right, where people meet and give feedback on 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 drafts, right? These are also really essential and and helpful in 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 getting the the uh, the process going forward. And I think that you know, even if you don't land with the press of your choice. There is a press out there that is interested in the work that you're doing. So don't take rejection as necessarily as a as a failure of yourself or your scholarship, but it's just there's another press that's more aligned with the kind of work that you're doing. And I think that that really helps. So I mean that's really, really the advice that I can give in terms of, you know, networking and getting contact. But it's it's really who you know and who you can get hold of. And, you know, talking to people who published before is is really insightful. Um and, and no one does anything alone. And I think that's you know, a, a really a hard lesson to learn if you had to do so much on your own being first gen to, to reach out and ask for help. And I think ask for help as often and as widely as possible. Thank you for that. Ma? Yes, I, I just everything that Anita and, and Mohammed has said um, that, that we are not and should not be doing this alone, right? Um, that folks who are not first gen they absolutely didn't do that, do it alone. Um, and so I think that, you know, oftentimes we think that we have to figure this out on our own and, and that's the, the, a difficult barrier. Um, I also had an opportunity to do small conferences and that was really, I think that's where I met people who, um, you know, who, who don't necessarily, who are not necessarily in my field, right? but who um, I struck up conversations with. And then I also, anyone who offered to read my stuff, there was a question about finding writing group or, or, or writing mentors. I actually take them up on their offer. Um, and so once I, um, you know, meet them and then, you know, feel comfortable with them, um, I, will, I will ask them over email um to 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 read you know like a chapter or, or a piece that i have written uh, for feedback and so that's a way that i got my work out there in terms of you know not not widely out there but you know to a couple people right who are willing to to give feedback um and then we also don't know that you know these folks might be on other committee, other committees, or doing other things that they can, they might think about our work, right? If um, a topic that's similar to ours comes up, so those are things that happen a lot on the back end, right? That that we don't know about, um, you know, um, getting folks to uh, or. So these kinds of connections. So I found peer mentoring is super, super helpful. Cause I think that when we think about mentors, it's the senior person in our field or or of course our, our faculty mentor, right? But in fact, uh, and this is what we developed early on in grad school is, is reading each other's work, right? Fellow grad students. And then it did get me comfortable to share my work with other people who I may not interact with on a regular basis, right? So that peer mentorship is key, has been key to, to help me um, grow and, 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 and work through, you know, some of the, the barriers um, that I experienced. Um, and then just, you know, I think that the, one of the hardest pieces for me has always been to tell my story about what I'm doing and what I need. Um, and, and so um, 
that's that was part of the writing um, and research process is to be able to communicate, okay, this is what I'm doing and this is what I need. Uh, so in a sense, you know, okay, I'm when I'm I'm writing, right? Because I think it is also hard to actually say that I'm writing as a priority. Um, and um, and then to be able to communicate, whether it's to colleagues in your department, um, what you need, and perhaps time off, right? Course release in order to write uh, resources or, or money for writing groups, right? Um, before the pandemic, we would be able to meet at coffee shops and get lunch and then write, right? Um, so that requires some resource as well. It's a small resource, but it's an important resource that tells us that we're supported. So. Thank you for that so much, um, all of you for speaking to the, the challenges institutionally of doing this stuff. Now, this is going to ask you about your second book or future books or edited things like that, because people tend to focus on, uh, most people focus on the first book as the main challenge. But for many first-gen scholars, how do you talk about the second book or future publishing and what do you have for them to keep going? Because oftentimes the first book is your dissertation with the help of a committee, with a chair. So having gone through all of you going through the first book process, how do you continue this process and trajectory? All right, back to you, Anita or Moham or Ma. Yeah. Oh, the second book is so much harder. <laughs> Maybe that's not true for everyone. And I'm sorry, those of you that are watching that are now like, I'm hanging up and that's it. Um, it. Let me just say that when you're a grad student, as hard as being a grad student is, you are focused almost exclusively other than, you know, TAing on your own writing and research. And as Long said, you do have this committee that is reading your work and providing feedback, right? Um, hopefully that becomes a, a first book, gets you tenure. Well, the minute that you get tenure, particularly if you're a person of color and a woman of color, any of the protections around doing campus service that exist when you're an early career faculty member where they say, you know, we're not going to give you all this committee work because we want you to get tenure, right? The minute you've got tenure, the gloves are off, right? And you are going to be hit with, we, we, we need you on this committee. We need you to do this, blah, 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 blah. And especially if you're a minoritized person, you know, they're going to want to put you on every committee, right? And of course, it's a blessing that our students come to us. I love my students, right? But there's a problem when a university like mine has 4% of its faculty are Latinx and almost 30% of our students are Latinx. We have a lot of students looking for faculty like them, right? So the service loads and the demands on faculty of color, women of color are enormous, right? So writing a second book while you're negotiating, you're teaching your additional service loads. Um, you know, you may have family, child care, child care elder care responsibilities that, that in the life cycle become more of a challenge, right? Um, and writing that second book. So for me, writing the second book was much harder right? I was doing it while parenting in a pandemic, etc. Uh, what can I say about how to do that? What I can say is you must continue to write things that you're passionate about and that you love, right? For me, I, I write from a combined place of moral outrage and love, moral outrage at the way that refugees and migrants and immigrants are treated and excluded and love for children as a, a former educator and as a mother, right? So I draw upon my rage and my love to continue writing. And I fuel my rage and my love by engaging in community work, right? And interacting with folks to remind myself of why it matters that I'm writing what I write. Um, so you have to find ways to fuel whatever it is that motivates you to write. And you also need to find ways to be very strategic about the service demands um, that are going to be placed upon you. Be in charge of your service. Do the service that feeds you, right? Um, I've done this by focusing on creating programs on my campus that do things that, that I care about, creating first-gen programs, creating other programs. And that way, when they ask you to do committee service that is meaning, meaningless and draining to you, you can answer, oh, no, sorry, I'm running all of these other programs for you. Um, I'm too busy to do that, right? So choose the service that feeds you. 
you're going to have to do a little of drudge service as well, but minimize it, right? Um, yeah, and right from your rage and your love. <laughs> right, rage against the machine. <laughs> Mohammed? Yeah, I'll keep this brief. Um, you know, again, I think that's such an important, um, what Anita said, not just for writing your second book, from your first book is, you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, barriers to to writing is, is their service load. And if you don't say no, it will always continue to be piled on to you. And I think that it, it can be morally so difficult where, you know, me as black faculty, you know, so many black, my first day, I had a line of black students wanted to talk to me and, and not having seen that and, and feeling the moral imperative to help, you know, first generation refugee students, you know, but again, the university still refuses to hire more black people and first gen and people of color and gives all the work to the few that are there. And so I think that, you know, going to get, going back and forth against that, I think it's just really about being strategic and talking to, you know, fellow colleagues and, men, and mentors, how they navigate service and how to be strategic about, uh, you know, the kind of service that you do, especially as you're trying to get tenure, because I'm, I'm not tenured yet. But what I will say for the second book, um, something that's helped me really think through is so, so often how we conceive about writing is, is, is so Eurocentric and individualized as you, the sole author working in isolation. And even that is not reality, right? Writing is always collective. But I think, you know, for a second book, thinking about uh, writing the book with other people, coming together with two, three other authors and writing together, you know, and I think that really sort of helps, you know, build community in the writing process strengthen the kind of research you want to do and that that could be an idea as well as as you want to go towards maybe a second or third book and and can really sort of a nullify some of the isolation of 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 the writing process but i think for me a skill set that that's really been important is no matter what is happening developing a daily writing habit despite how difficult that might that might be right and and sort of see not writing as a reflection of your thoughts but as a way of thinking Right. So you think through writing and you're generating new ideas and you're working within the community and whatever you're doing. But um, I, I, I think that those are sort of some of the thoughts I have. And I haven't even started conceiving of my second book. So this is all conjecture. But um, that's what I have to say so far. Yes. We only have a minute left um, to get to Q&A. But Ma, do you have any brief? Yeah, I'll say you? something briefly about the writing and service and then and then I'm going to talk about some of the questions that's been in the chat and the Q&A. Um, yes, that, that absolutely service becomes a another barrier, right? And and the the what I have learned is that the better you get doing the service, you the more you're asked to do. And so then it's hard to stop that train. And so and I don't know how to do it yet. But there should be a way to, and this is what I was saying earlier when I said tell, to tell our story definitely, that we we're, we are prioritizing our writing so that we're, so the better we get at writing and publishing, that that's what we do, right? That's our story and not that we are great at um, being on committees and writing memos, which are important too, right? But uh, faculty of color, do get asked to do much, much, much more of that service, right? Um, and so, and we're good at it, doesn't mean we want to do it all the time, right? So, um, so that's something that I, I've been thinking about. Um, but I want to, there's questions in the chat and, and the Q&A about um, a process of finding an editor and then you know, submitting manuscript. I know the the later session we'll we'll talk more about this, but I just want to share my experience a little bit. Um, so I I met um, I did meet editors at conferences, right? So I did take up those opportunities to sort of pitch my project, actually bring a proposal, um, and one editor looked at it and marked it up and suggested a different title right away. But you know. That's fine. I took it as a process, right? Of, of how do I sort of talk about my work with editors? And so then that got me to um, sort of just have a conversation with editors. And even though I wasn't ready to submit anything. Um, and so I eventually um, 
reconnected with the editor at Duke who I had met my last year of grad school. So I reconnected with her, you know, right before I was gonna submit my manuscript, right? This is, and so um, I know it's, it's I think that's the other barriers that it's intimidating to talk to editors. And, uh, but it was, but the reality for, for me was once I sent that initial email and reminded her that she may not have remembered me, but we did meet. And of course she doesn't remember me, right? But she did say, thank you for the reminder, right? So, I, so in my experience, editors are um, not bad, right? <laughs> to communicate with. But I think that we have, I especially have a lot of anxieties about because in academia, there are a lot of anxieties about do people actually mean what they say, right? And this is how we navigate with our colleagues, right? But somebody told me, no, editors don't do that, right? They mean what they say. So you don't have to spend extra time trying to figure out what they mean. Um, you know, take them at what they're saying to you, whether it's an email or whatnot. So that actually relieved a lot of that stress for me in, in uh, feeling intimidated in connecting with an editor. Um, and so then once I got that process going, it was a little bit easier, right? That, that communication piece. Um, and then the other parts of it is that before I actually got to send out my manuscript, um, I learned from colleagues at my institution that they hired editors, right? Folks who freelance to edit your work. Um, I mean, especially for those of us who in, uh, English is a second language. Um, and to, if there are things that are unclear in, in the chapters or whatnot, that um, folks, that you know that an editor that you you work with uh, can help you clarify before you actually send out the manuscript. Um, so that was super helpful. And but that re takes resources, right? That means that we need to get resources from our deans or our chair to be able to work with uh, uh, someone who can read our work. And the truth of the matter is that we do have peer cult, peer mentors and or mentors who are, you know, more senior, but they're not in, at, at a stage when you're an assistant professor, I found that people are busy, right? Folks are not gonna be able to have time to commit to reading your, all of your chapters. Um, and so it's, for me, it was about, okay, perhaps getting a chapter to an editor to read and then another chapter to a colleague or a friend who could read and give me feedback, right? So, you know, doing that kind of um, uh, work. And the, the question about, and I don't know, the folks at UC Press may have a different answer to um, submitting um, simultaneous submissions, but when I uh, did it, I submitted to Duke and University of Minnesota, and um, I was transparent. So I asked first to see if I could, right? So I talked to each editor and said, I would like to submit to your press, but I'm also talking to this editor at this other press. Would you be okay with me submitting at the same time? And they were both fine with it. Um, they understood sort of the tenure track process and the timeline. And so, um, you know, so. I think you can, you have to be transparent about what, about it and you have to ask. Um, and I think that's the biggest piece uh, is just to ask, right? It seems like these questions that it's really difficult to ask because we feel like we should know and other people know it, but maybe we don't. Hey, that's great. And that's the question about shopping around that relates also to language. And so uh, the question is posed to Nita uh, Mohammed that is based on Ma's comments, which is how do you shop around and how do you 
find one that honors working in a different language in English as an alternative language. So yes, that's a question posed to you too. So I th this is a hard question because let's be real here. The idea of shopping around doesn't recognize the sort of the power structure that's involved when you are an early career person and you are desperate to publish your first book, right? There is an imbalance there. It is very hard to shop around when you are an early career scholar, right? Um, so let's just be real about that. Um, with, with that being said, I lucked out that, and I want to shout out to UNC Press and to Elaine Meisner, who was my editor there, um, who is just a model of ethics and professionalism and courtesy, right? And some presses and some editors are better than others, right? So if you're working for a press <laughs> and you're in this Zoom, um, I hold up to you my incredible editor, Elaine Meisner, as a role model for responsibility and respect and courtesy, right? Like, I would like to see presses and editors also really take on board that obligation to care for their authors, to show respect for the authors. Um, but when you're looking for that first, you know, someone to publish your work, you're largely going to take what you can get, aren't you, with that first book. Um, before you get to that stage, though, talk to faculty and senior people that you trust and ask them which presses treat their authors with respect which presses like the kind of writing that I'm doing. Um, Ma, for example, your work so resonates with what Duke is all about, right? Um, like my work is, it fits with UNC Press, right? Like I didn't know that, but senior folks did and they told me. So for me, really all of the specific technical questions come back to find that small community with mentors across generations, that you can direct these questions to, right? Anyways, I, that's not really an answer to the question. I'm sorry, Long. <laughs> that, that was a fantastic answer, <laughs> yes. Mohammed? What was the, que what was the question again? Uh, I was so captured. By it, was a question it, of, <laughs> it was a question of uh, looking for presses, making that initial contact, but also one that finds a press where you're working across multiple languages as well, that they get the project in that sense. Right, right. Um, so I, I think, you know, to echo again what some of Anita said, I think, you know, many of us are publishing towards tenure and really keeping that in mind, right? Uh, not necessarily for the, for, the, for the sake of it. And I think, you know, what regard, you know, finding out what kind of institution you're at, right? And, and what kind of presses senior faculty have published in to get tenure or recently tenured faculty, right? Um, and just really making sure that ultimately that, you know, you get tenure. I think that's number one in terms of thinking about, you know, what presses to shop at. Uh, but, but also, again, to go like along, it's like, you know, what your orientations are, right? Um, I was really excited about UC Press because of, you know, the, um, you know, the orientation towards, you know, doing social justice work, right? Uh, much of my scholarship is about uh, ongoing activism that is happening in the community. And, you know, um, and, you know, it, it's they've been really helpful in terms of even you know including some Somali languages and words in the text uh, you know to some extent in some poetry uh, so I think you know really not only strategizing for tenure but also you know ultimately despite what the reviewers say what the press say like you know in your heart what you want to say and what you want to produce and ultimately you don't want to produce a book that doesn't reflect you so really finding a press that reflects your core mission what is important to you and what you want to say because it's easy to to lose yourself right um and and write in a way or in in a mode that is so for me you know i, I incorporate a lot of autoethnography in my work as well and i couldn't necessarily publish in a in a press that considered autoethnography not scholarship right or or you know devoid of object of of a, of a objectivity right and, and, and so i think finding that is, and that was so critical to write about the somali refugee experience while living it Right and 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 articulating right the you know the subject object duality of knowledge production right um, and so um, I think that's been really helpful as well. Okay, and we and for those asking questions about technical issues um, that will show up in the panel with the, all the editors from UC Press, so they will answer questions about you know the logistics of finding the press and working through that. So we only have a few minutes left, but I wanna ask all of you, the panelists, 
what have you changed in terms of your whole process? And, you know, writing it will change you. And what p final piece of advice do you have for first-gen authors and scholars? Okay. Um, be, be true to yourself, but be strategic. Do that dance, right? If you're first gen, if you're low income, if you're an immigrant or a refugee or a person of color, you've spent your whole life doing this dance, right? Figuring out how do I move? How do I succeed while staying true to myself, right? Got to be willing to give a little here and there, but know what your deal breaking line is and don't cross it, right? Um, for me, for example, in my first book, I wrote sort of a more traditional history um, and, and used sort of a traditional scholarly voice. Although I had good mentorship as a grad student where I was taught that if you care about your community and you wanna write for your community, write in a voice that an intelligent high school graduate from your community could make sense of, right? So I like to think that my writing has always been reasonably clear and straightforward for an academic, um, but I still sort of observed scholarly uh, conventions fairly strictly in my first book, right? It's how you sort of, you prove to the machine that you can do it, right? In my second book, I used first person voice in my intro. I was like, I'm writing this book, I'm doing it this way, here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm not doing. And I spoke directly in a way that I didn't do in my first book. And I'm flexing my muscles in a way now that I couldn't with that first book, right? So be aware that yes, you can be true to yourself and you've gotta know where your lines are, but also know that like you pay your dues and you flex more and more as you go along, right? And the more we flex for one another, the more the space will broaden for us to be authentic and bring our voices and our experiences into the field over time. Great. Mohammed Ma, final piece of advice. Um, I, I can jump in briefly. Um, you know, to, the, the writing process is grueling. It is disorienting. It is tiring, exhausting. It's, you know, I mean, mine was a, my dissertation turned book you know, and it still was, you know, a three to four year process, right? And I think it's very easy to lose motivation and to lose sight. But I think trying to remember why you took on this project in the first place, who you're writing for, you know, what your what your mission is and, and remembering that, right? So I, I talked to my mom a lot about the book I'm writing and she, you know, you know, you know, didn't go to high school and, and, and just so confused as to why it's taking so long and why they're treating me so poorly. And, and I think that, you know, again, ultimately, like I am trying to write, even though it will never succeed to approximate, you know, her strength and resiliency and impossibility of what she did to come from a refugee camp and, and build a whole life for herself from scratch, right? And these are the stories and the people and the communities I'm trying to highlight. So when you are dealing with, you know, the daily grind of work and all those services, ultimately remembering who you're writing for and why you're doing this is what's going to get you through not a couple of days, but a four to five year project, because the process from revision to final publication will take four to five, if not longer. And I think remembering that is, is kind of is, is what will fuel you to continue going. OK, great, Ma. Um, just quickly, uh, I want to say something to the earlier question, the last question about editor or you know how did you choose or whatnot um and i would say uh that yes that we you know as an assistant professor that we're on a timeline right and so sometimes how we choose presses and editors is also based on the responsiveness of the editor um that works with our timeline right and so it is about being flexible about the of course, there's the one press or the top two presses in our list that we want to go with, but it's, and, and Anita spoke to this earlier, it's about how editors um, work with authors. Um, and so if it takes a month to respond, to get a response from your editor that you're connecting with, then that's not ideal, right? Um, and I would recommend uh, asking around for um, other editors uh, at presses that actually are more responsive um, because we can't wait around for a month right to get an answer to a question um, that we have yes and that's a great uh final comment to get into the next panel about the editors i would like to thank once again our wonderful panelists they did such a great job of speaking to first-gen issues 
you know, people assume that first gen people just don't know technical stuff. Like everyone just needs to, it's just the mechanics of writing. But as you've seen today, the panel is talking about social, cultural, and familial issues related to how they can speak to their community. So once again, I'd like to thank UC Press and the panelists for a wonderful chat and the panelists for all your wonderful questions. And I'll pass it over to Teresa. Hi, everyone. Yeah, just thank you for the panelists for being here. Thank you um, also to everyone who's attended and put their comments in chat. We're going to take just a couple minutes of a break and we're going to start part two with all of our editors um, at about 1 p.m. And many of you put questions um, in the chat about the publishing process. So the editors will speak a little bit more to those aspects in part two. All right. All right, thank you all. For those who are staying, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. All right. So we're going to kick off part two with presentations from our editors on the publishing process. And Kim Robinson is actually going to moderate um, this session and introduce our editors. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to pull up the slides here. All right, Kim, you can take it away. Great. I'm Kim Robinson. I'm the editorial director here at UC Press, and I'm so pleased to be here and to welcome all of you to this part of our event on demystifying the book publishing process. It was really great to hear from authors on the panel today and learn from their experiences and valuable insights. Uh, we're now going to move on to presentations from four acquiring editors here at UC Press. Um, each of the presentations will be about 10 minutes, and then we'll wrap up with about 15 minutes left for questions. Um, and just a reminder, we will be sending out the recording next week uh, for all registered participants if you miss anything. Um, so each of the acquisitions editors will discuss key aspects of the publishing process. First up, we'll be talking about uh, from dissertation to book. And Raina Polivka, the editor for film, music, and media studies, will discuss that aspect. And next, we'll move on to preparing the book proposal, and we'll hear from Kate Marshall, our Anthropology and Food Studies editor. Um, third up will be Archana Patel, our Art History editor, who will talk about finding the right press and approaching editors. And finally, we'll end with a kind of overview of the book publishing process once you're with a press, um, peer review, production, and marketing, and that will be covered by Niels Hooper, our editor for Modern History, American Studies, and Middle Eastern Studies. So I'm now going to hand it over to Raina. Great. Thanks so much, Kim. Let me just pull up my notes here. So I'm going to be talking about the process of um, kind of revising the dissertation. Um, and so for those of you, you might be in various different stages of your career or in graduate school, but this is really geared towards transitioning from that dissertation process into the first book. Um, so Teresa, if you could move to the next slide, please. There we go. Where to begin? So you've successfully defended your dissertation. Now what? Well, first, you must accept the fact that your book will look very different from the dissertation. Often editors hear common phrases such as I've written my dissertation like a book or my advisor suggests that this could be published as is. But it's important to recognize that a dissertation is an exercise in dem demonstrating mastery over a subject. It's written for a small committee of experts and under inordinate pressures and time constraints. Things like funding pressures, teaching, service, and the personal challenges in grad school. A book, on the other hand, is an original contribution that should be written uh, that should be written to be read by a more expansive audience of the intellectually curious, a specific community of readers, and yes, to experts too. Like many good things in life, writing a good book takes time. As Mohammed said earlier, it can take up to three to four years to, to get off the ground. And that's one of the first things I really recommend is taking time away from the dissertation once, it, once it's defended. Tuck it in a drawer and pick up a book, perhaps one that you've enjoyed dipping into during your research or a book that you never got around to reading during graduate school. Read a novel or some poetry, but read it like a writer. What is the author doing that is successful or unsuccessful? 
How do they present their ideas? How do they execute their argument? Think about things like pacing, storytelling, and organization. Now is also the time to start putting yourself out there and really developing your own identity as a scholar you want to become. This means populating and participating in the spaces that are important to you and your work. Conferences are a great place to do this. Of course, we're still in the virtual sphere, but hopefully one day. Um, presenting on your work and getting feedback is an invaluable way to test drive your ideas at these early stages. What's working? What isn't? What seems interesting to other people? Can some of your dissertation be repurposed and revised for a journal article? Again, this is a great way to get your name out there as the person that's working on or doing X, Y, or Z. And are there more public forums, social media, blogs, industry publications, popular platforms, where you can flex your writing muscles for an audience that is intellectually curious, but perhaps not experts? All of these strategies will help you develop your voice as a writer and a thinker. And next slide, please, Teresa. Great. So the book will be your foray into the public reading world and will lay the groundwork for your career. It's important to think about who your audience is and to write for that audience. Publishers want books to reach as wide an audience as possible so that it has lasting impact and of course, to sell more books. Um, but it's also important to be realistic. It's unlikely that a first book will be read by that ever elusive general reader um, and however, not all your readers will be experts. So you'll need to provide context around your ideas for those that are coming to this anew. And if you're writing for readers across disciplines or in specific communities, be sure that you define your terms and fill in any gaps that may be important for understanding the larger argument from one discipline to another. The thesis will be the spine of your book and will form the basis for that hook the idea that attracts readers in the first place and that keeps them engaged for the duration. Was there a nugget you discovered in your dissertation research that you are unable to pursue or unpack fully? Was there a particular chapter that was the most enjoyable to research and write? Was the dissertation a launch pad to think more expansively about a particular topic? As our colleague Scott, Scott Norton has said, a thesis can be more than a sober statement of fact or belief. It is a gauntlet thrown down before readers, daring them to think back. A good thesis is claim staking and will, art and will articulate what you are doing that is unique and important. Okay, also eliminate and minimize lengthy review of literature and theory, especially in your introduction. Unlike a dissertation, a book is not intended to display the wide range of your intellectual wares, nor your command of everything published under the sun. Leave it out of your narrative and place it in your notes only if it's essential. Avoid littering your narrative path with what we call theory bombs. These are short drive-by references to the works of others. For example, as Foucault has argued, or as contrary to Butler, I have shown. In an effort to demonstrate mastery, often dis dissertations become a place to exhaustively list one example after another or one case study after another. These should be carefully curated for the book. What are the most relevant? Don't forget to fill in those historical or intellectual gaps to provide context for the non-experts that will come to your book. Documentation, notes, and bibliography should always be in service to the reader. Avoid having entire discussions or arguments in the notes. And rather than appearing like a dumping ground, the notes should be carefully crafted to provide references and citations. Finally, readability and voice. I uh, can't emphasize this enough. The strictures surrounding dissertation writing seldom produce readable writing. Stuffy phrases, passive voice, attribution, and polysyllabic jargon are roadblocks to the path of readership. Avoid too many citations and block quotes. Don't let others speak for you. Be assertive. You are now the expert and must lead your reader down the path of your ideas. Read it aloud. As our colleague Naomi Schneider often says, does it sing or sag? Your goal with the book is not to sound as smart or impenetrable as possible, but rather to have your book read as accessibly as possible. And remember, don't just write to be published, write to be read. I will pass it off to my colleague, Kate Marshall. Thanks, Raina, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about preparing the book proposal. You can go to the first slide, Teresa. 
Okay, so um, years ago I was on a panel. So everyone's book proposal starts with a summary of the contents of the book. And I was on a panel years ago with a colleague who said, start with the five W's. And I remember at the time thinking it was a little strange to be reminded of this high school prompt. But ever since then, when I look at proposals, I do think the most effective proposals start by explaining who, what, where, when, and most importantly, why a project is important. So the goal in the summary is to emphasize the original argument and story, not how your book fits into the field. Um, you know, put your argument up front and don't bury the lead. Um, and, you know, it's very important to sort of establish early on what's at stake and what you want readers to come away and understand from reading your book. Think of this as being something that is five paragraphs, not five pages long. Um, after your summary of your book, you want to follow with an annotated table of contents. Um, the, so you think of your table of contents as the backbone and roadmap for your book. You're not providing um, an excessive amount of information here, but you might consider having solid chapter titles that really explain what's in the chapter. These can always be revised later. And then provide one or two sentences that explains more or less what the reader can expect in each chapter. Uh, next slide, please. The next part um, of a book proposal, and I should say that most publishers have what uh, most university presses will list out what they want in their book proposal on their website, but these are just sort of general things that I recommend including. Um, so the next part would be to include a market overview. Um, so in terms of the audience, you should clarify who you're writing for. Um, are you writing for scholars? Are you writing for undergraduates, graduate students? Are you writing for policymakers? Or are you writing for the general educated public or a particular niche audience outside of academia? Um, generally, editors um, and publishing professionals say that most books do not reach all readers. So we want you to be realistic. Um, it's completely okay if the audience for a scholarly book is other scholars and students, but give us give your publisher as much information as you can share about how this fits into the field and um, you know how it might be used in teaching. Okay, next slide. Okay. Many, many publishers will ask you to submit a CV, but I also recommend including um, a narrative biography about you that, you know, might say something interesting about you as a person, where you were trained, who your intellectual community is, but it should also highlight your platform. And a platform can mean different things, but really, you know, the question's worth wondering is, where are you online? You know, are you on Twitter? Are you on social media? Do you have a web page or uh, do you have your own web page? Um, where are you publishing? Like, are you publishing, you know, if there are academic journals, but if there are non-academic spaces where you are part of public conversations, even if you're writing a scholarly book, we want to know about it. Where do you give talks? Where do you speak? What conferences do you attend? Who is your intellectual community? And then to some extent, what motivates your work, particularly if it's political and you're engaged with a particular community that is represented in your book, we wanna know about it. Um, and the reason I stress this is because your publisher is your partner. Um, and as much as you can share about yourself and how you would partner with us to get your book out into the world, uh, that's sort of the beginning of a collaboration. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then a very, very important part of every solid book proposal are just logistical details and information, what we call the nuts and bolts. Um, so it's important to spell out how many words you think your total manuscript will be. That will be everything, your notes, bibliography, your captions, your acknowledgements. Um, most books, uh, you know, because when you finally sign a book contract, there's going to be a maximum word count because we use that to um, estimate how much the book will cost to copy edit and pr later produce. Um, so most books I publish, depending on the field, range between 75,000 words to about 110,000 words. It's worth noting that if you're significantly under that number or significantly over, um, that might warrant a conversation with your editor. Um, 
we know that people adopt smaller books these days or shorter books these days. So a really long book, sometimes um, it, it really depends on the topic, but the, an editor might ask you to focus on cutting. Um, it's also helpful to know what is your timeline for completion. I sometimes say if you're more than 12 or 18 minute, months out from finishing the manuscript, you might be submitting a little bit early. Um, Many publishers will ask you to submit suggestions for external reviewers. These are not advisors. They can't be your peers. They're people, but there can be people that you know. In the time of COVID, I'm telling people to send a long list, like 10 or 12 names. And then you should provide any other logistical information that might be essential for your publisher to know. Can you bring in a subvention? Um, are any of the chapters previously published? Generally, we ask people not to publish more than one, maybe two chapters from the book. Um, we don't want, in a five chapter book, we don't want four chapters to already be out there in the world. And then finally, um, we just ask everyone to be transparent about whether or not you are asking the editor to compete with other presses. Some editors will elect not to compete for a book and that's just something you need to be aware of as you're submitting. And I think that's it. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is a good time, especially if you're in grad school or a recent grad to start researching presses. The best place to start is your bookshelf. You wanna look for books that have been published in the last three to five years um, and, thinking, and think about who's publishing the books that you're most excited about. The other important thing to do right now is to start surveying the current publishing landscape. In other words, you want to find out who's actively publishing in your area. So before the pandemic, strolling the exhibit hall at a conference was a great way to see who's doing what, with the goal of figuring out who's attending conferences that matter to you and what they're showcasing. So for example, the press publishes in many area studies like Latin American studies or Asian studies, but neither of those lists include literary studies. So if you're someone who goes to MLA, you'll notice that we don't have a booth, there aren't editors there, and that's something that you should be aware of if you want your book to be at a specific conference, talking to a specific audience. So this becomes a little harder in the virtual space, but presses are doing different creative things to announce their books. So presses are doing a lot of virtual exhibit halls, also doing more extensive social media campaigns. Um, you can also look at past conference programs, which almost always include a list of past exhibitors um, and use that as a guide to start exploring press websites. Um, if you're on Twitter, I recommend following editors, following presses, uh, paying attention to conference hashtags, which oftentimes presses use more than conference participates um, and gives you a real sense of what's going on at a press through social media. Um, something else that I recommend is signing up for subject-specific e-newsletters for fields that you're interested in. So, for example, when you go on the UC Press website, you can sign up for our general email newsletter, but you can also sign up for the art newsletter, for the history newsletter, in fields that you're interested in. Um, this is also a good time to talk to people about their recent publishing experience. As much as we all love our advisors, um, publishing from 10 or more years ago is probably not going to be a good representation of what a publishing experience looks like today. Um, many things in publishing have changed, so you want to talk with people who have recently published. Um, you can talk about their experience, you can ask them to connect you to their editor if that's something that you're interested in. These conversations can be something where you pitch your project, but can also be about just learning more about the publishing process. While you're doing all of these different things, the bottom line is that you should keep trying to figure out what's most important to you. So is it the reputation of a press? Is it the size of their publishing program in your field? Is it the peer review process? Is it the production timeline, marketing support, or are you interested in a specific type of publishing? Um, for example, if you're interested in open access, um, you know, looking at presses that have a strong platform, have a history of publishing open access. Um, 
Something else to consider is exploring different book series. So a lot of books are not published in a series, but I mention it because editors tend to meet a lot of authors through series editors. And because series editors are fellow scholars, it can be an easy way to connect with the press. Um, next slide, please. Oh, we did it. Thanks, Teresa. <laughs> Um, so this is all research you should do before submitting your proposal, because it will help you figure out which specific editors at different presses you want to approach. So I think when you're thinking about approaching an editor, the biggest misconception is that you have to wait until you've 100% finished your project to do so. It's really the complete opposite. You should definitely be making some headway in, into thinking about revising your dissertation, which you should try to connect with an editor beforehand. We receive hundreds of proposals and queries over email. And while we do review each and every one of them, cold emailing an editor is not usually the best way to get in touch. So if you connect with an editor beforehand, we'll be in a better position to look out for your proposal when you do submit it and um, take a closer look. In pre-COVID times, um, again, academic conferences were a great moment to connect with an editor face-to-face. -face. Um, I do wanna to touch on this briefly in case that ever happens ever again. Um, but if you wanna meet with an editor at a conference, uh, reach out to them a month or so before they start at the conference. If you wait until the week of or the day of, it'll be too late. And most editors will have already filled up their schedules. Um, at the conference itself, we always try to block out time to stay in the booth. But again, if you try to spin by, there's a chance you may miss us or we'll be busy helping someone else out. So requesting a meeting is the best way forward. Um, so if you do book a meeting, um, it's helpful to send a proposal beforehand to give us some background information. This does not guarantee that we'll be fluent on the project by the time we meet. I'm afraid being in meeting number 15 that day, not seeing any sunlight because you're stuck on some third sub-level of a venue can mess with your mind a little bit, but it's still helpful. Even if you do submit your proposal, I may still ask you the same basic questions. Don't lead with a chapter by chapter breakdown. What I wanna hear is what is this book about? Why do you care about it? And why should I? This may seem a little repetitive, but what I found is people are much better answering these questions clearly and with some passion uh, in a conversation rather than a proposal. And so I like to approach these meetings as having a conversation over a cup of coffee. So you tell me things, I ask some questions and we suss out the answers together. Another reason why these meetings um, are a conversation, not a presentation, whether they're over Zoom or in person, is that you should also feel free to ask questions. This is your opportunity to figure out if this is the right home for your project and this is the editor you wanna work with. Your goal should be to find an editor who's excited about your work. Remember that your editor is your advocate at the press. They're the person building excitement for the book with their colleagues. They're the person you go to when there's a problem. You wanna find someone who you think gets your book and is excited about it. In an ideal scenario, you should have a collaborative partnership with your publisher. You wanna pick a home where you feel your work is valued. So now that we don't really have in-person conferences, take advantage that there's no geographic restrictions to meet face-to-face. -face. If you're attending a virtual conference, see if the editor is on a publishing panel, sign up for virtual office hours, use social media to get in touch. You can reach out anytime, but if you still prefer to do it around a virtual conference, I would recommend reaching out after the conference where the editor is a little bit less busy. You know, if they were on a panel that you attended, if you're attending this talk right now, when you send out an email, put, put that in the email. So bottom line, especially when you're working on your first book, you should be making some good headway on the revisions, but it's okay to connect with an editor before you formally submit. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Niels. 
Thank you, Archana. Um, I'm Neil Super. Um, that was a perfect segue because the editor being your advocate is a, uh, a, a good entry into, into the process of the book when it's at the press. Um, we manage the peer review process. And I just want to sort of emphasize, I'm going to try and keep my presentation brief, but I just want to emphasize through all of this that um, it, it, it's probably, especially for a first book, a very anxiety producing time, letting it go to an editor, letting it go to a press, letting, you know, letting other people work on it. But we're really, the whole process um, from the beginning, from the peer review to, to my third slide, which would be about marketing, is really, I'm trying to work with you to realize your vision for the book and get it to the audiences you want it to reach. Um, it's, and, and everything that we're doing um, and the other people that touch the book through the process is, 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 uh, is sort of aims to, uh, to meet that end. Um, why the, it's important that the editor gets the book is because we do manage the review process. You know, we will always ask you who your wish list for reviewers are. We're not trying to catch out, catch catch you out with the book. Um, once we invest in sending the book out for review, we want it to work, um, and that's why um, it gets a little tricky once you have two presses sort of sending the same book out for review because we we want it to work at that stage and we're investing time in it. Um, uh, we will do it and we will compete against other presses, um, but um, but it's good to be transparent about that. Um, the, the best review process is a collegial, constructive, honest, and inspiring process. We're not, we're looking for um, reviewers that will see the potential that we see in the book and help you realize that potential. Um, we'll ask you for your suggestions. We may or may not use them. It's an anonymous process, but, um, but we want it to work and we want the, the review process to help the book achieve its potential. Um, we will look to, let's say you're doing a book on environmental justice that deals with race and inequality. We will look for um, reviewers that can speak to the different audiences that, the, that you're trying to reach on the book. So if somebody in environmental justice, somebody that does ethnic studies, race and inequality. Um, so we, you know, those are the types of reviewers for that project we would, we would look for. Um, and we are very attentive and more so all the time to, um, thinking about diversity in, in reviews as well, especially, you know, um, to, to, for, for first gen um, authors and scholars. Um, again, as, as one of the other panelists mentioned in the previous, um, uh, you know, uh, presentation, um, we don't want to overload minority scholars with, with, with projects. And sometimes it's hard to, to, to find the right scholars, but we definitely, um, we, we are diversifying our, um, peer review lists um, um, along gender lines, minority lines, first gen lines, um, and and it's very important to us that people that review your book can help it reach the communities you want to reach. Um, uh, I, oh yeah, I should just just talk about the faculty board. But we different different university presses have different um, faculty board processes. We, we do the peer review first, and we'll offer you a contract. Um, and then once you've revised, we'll take the book to the faculty board. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's really just the, the process is to make sure that the peer review has been done properly and that the book, um, you know, that, that, that's also a constructive part of the process. The next slide. Um, then um, once the book comes into the press, you're gonna meet a lot of other people. Again, the editor will, um, will sort of oversee and be the point person within the press. They're your advocate within the press through the whole process. Um, but uh, uh, you will meet a lot of other people. An editorial assistant helps the editor with all aspects of the acquiring process, but particularly when the book starts going into production, they will work with you on um, permissions for the images on, um, you know, making sure the quality of the images are okay. Um, you know, the, the, the specificity, the, the um, way you need to submit your final manuscript um, to meet our production, um, uh, you know, specifications. Then will the book will be handed up to, over to a production editor and you will be in direct touch with a production editor through the rest of the process. 
that editor will be different from the sponsoring editor, um, but they will manage the copy editing, um, the page setting, um, the proofing. Um, you will get the manuscripts back at different stages through that to check the copy edits, to check the proofs, to generate the index. Um, so it's a very tight and um, uh, uh, um, you know, busy process. It really does take the eight to 10 months to publication um, for the book. Uh, right now, it's actually taking longer because there are printing uh, um, and a lot of printers across the US for all, for all publishers are dealing with labor shortages and supply chain shortages due to COVID. So the printing is taking longer than it used to for all books, for all publishers. Um, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it is a tight process. You need to, you need to plan on the 10 months um, uh, from backwards from when you need the book out um, to, uh, to get it in. Um, and it is contingent on, on your you know, participation in that process. I did see questions earlier about, you know, English as a second language. Um, and we do, uh, we do have levels of copy edits that deal with English as a second language. Um, so we, we do work with, with authors on, um, you know, challenges in the production process. Um, and it's, but it, you know, I can't, I just can't stress enough how important it is to be, to be a sort of timely in that part of the process. Um, working with a production editor. We, the next slide will deal with marketing and publicity, but we, we start working on that, uh, you know, 10 months um, before the books come out. Uh, and so the books really need to make, make those dates once they're in, in production. And the success of the book in speaking to the audiences, you and, and being in the right bookstores and, and being available for courses and speaking to the communities you want to speak to, uh, does mean the book needs to come out when we've announced it. Um, so we start that process again, uh, before you even hand in the final book for production. Um, we will think about the jacket with you, we'll think about the title with you, we'll think about the blurb, you know, what, what would be the ideal blurb us uh, to get the books to the audiences you want to reach. Um, and we will sort of start strategizing that before we even put the book into production uh, almost a year before the publication date. Um, once you hand the book in, um, it's a good time to start thinking about your platform while we're working on the book. Um, and again, as, as one of the previous editors uh, mentioned, you know, making sure that you're, you're speaking to the community. So they want to read your book when it comes out. Um, and you can do that any way that's comfortable to you. It could be Twitter, it could be, you know, talking in community spaces, it could be um, writing journal articles, but it could be writing articles in non-academic you know, non venues as well. Um, we, you know, we have, you'll be in a, you will be in touch with a marketing person at the press, you'll be in touch with a publicist at the press, more as you know, it gets closer to the publication date. Um, and it's really important that, that you, you know, you communicate with your editor, with, with the marketing and publicity, which audiences you want to reach and what ideas you have for reaching those audiences as well. Um, and then after the book comes out, the work is never done. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are uh, anything that you can work with us on in talking to, uh, talking at events, um, talking on uh, virtual spaces like this, um, writing, thinking about current events and writing editorials or opinion pieces about how your work relates to um, what's going on, um, using your contacts uh, to get the book out um, and thinking about how it could be used in courses and speaking to people about that. And then even then, a year later, um, your book will be eligible for prizes. And so thinking with us about which, which prizes it needs to go to, which you could win, um, and, and working with us on that um, is key. Um, you know, I saw a lot of uh, questions earlier about, um, you know, reaching non-academic audiences, especially um, if, if, you know, uh, in different languages, um, you know, I, partnering, we, we're very, you know, we want to do that <laughs> as much as you do and partnering with us and offering us advice on how to do that. Um, and, um, and we will support you in, in, in outreach to those communities too, once your book comes out. But yeah, I'm just happy to open it up to questions to see what, um, what else you're interested in. 
Great, thank you so much to all the editors. Those were super helpful presentations. And there, again, there will be a recording sent out. And I know that people have been posting a lot of um, questions in the Q&A. And so I'm just gonna read aloud a few of the questions that have been asked uh, more than once so we can just get uh, folks to chime into it. I think a lot of people, it's a common question about when should you submit your dissertation to a press? Should you submit the unrevised dissertation, assuming it should be, it would be revised through the peer review process, or should you revise first and then submit? So does anyone want to feel that? Kate, I'm going to call on you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, despite sort of earlier feedback, we really, really want to see revised material. Um, in fact, when an editor pitches a first book, um, at least at University of California Press, we're asked to explain how the book project is different than the dissertation, because we're not in the business of copy editing dissertations, which can be accessed, even if you embargo them, they, they're, they are accessible, you can get them. Um, and um, we just really, as we've gone throughout this talk, we think the dissertation project is really different than your first book. So, so I, you know, I think it's okay to start a conversation with an editor to try to meet someone at a conference at an early stage. You might get really useful feedback about how you're framing the book or um, your ideas and arguments, um, or you might realize that a press that you are interested in is not the right fit at all, right? So this is part of, it works both ways in terms of shopping around. You should be looking for an editor that you work with. But yeah, to answer that question, we really do want to see revised materials um, before you're formally submitting for a yes or no and to go out for peer review. Great, there are also a lot of questions about developmental editors. Um, should they be hired to help with proposal? Should they be hired before submitting to a press? When can you justify the expense of a developmental editor? Raina, do you wanna weigh in on that? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it, it really varies by project and by uh, your kind of confidence as a writer. Um, <clears throat> It's certainly not required. I mean, we have, uh, this has become kind of a new trend, especially among younger scholars who are getting really great, whether it's monetary support or otherwise from their institutions to provide this resource for kind of fine tuning um, their writing chops. And developmental editors can come in, can, can do multiple things. Um, they can do close line edits of your work and work directly on the prose. They can do things like help with organization and flow of your argument. They can do things like help with kind of the, the, the notes and the logistics and all those little bits and pieces that can really trip people up throughout the, the writing and publishing process, as well as help kind of serve as a project manager to bring, you know, to make sure permissions are, are gathered and high res images. So developmental editors, it's kind of like the umbrella term for a lot of different services that they can provide. And as I mentioned, none of it is required, but it certainly does help um, it may help you either have a smoother process on your end for submitting that that final work, whether it's um, the the proposal to the editor or the final manuscript to be published. Um, and it could. It, and on the other hand, um, they can also uh, they can also help kind of reach the uh, help you reach the audience that you're striving to to reach if you're finding that difficult. Um, some people, uh, there's certain services that offer help with proposals at the early stage. The proposal, as Kate Marshall mentioned, is a totally different genre of writing. Um, and so maybe that's an area where you might feel you need support. Um, on the other hand, when you have that complete draft of the manuscript, maybe you need some support there to kind of do that deep dive and help you get it to where you want it to go. Thank you, Raina. So I'm going to ask, a, the question was posed about, uh, is it necessary to have a social media presence, but maybe talk a little bit about, you know, an author's platform and if social media is a critical part of that. Niels, do you want to talk about that a bit? Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> um, the question was posed is, is it necessary to have a social media presence? But I would just say, like, how do we define an author having a platform? Is the social media a, a crucial part of having a platform? No, I, I mean, I think um, 
uh, our, my advice would be, uh, and I, I, I suspect my colleagues would say the same, that, um, that it's whatever's comfortable to you. If you don't already have a social media presence, um, it might seem artificial to just create one, unless you're very confident about it or, or keen on doing it um, just for the book. Um, uh, it's, it, well, I think the social media presence works best when you already are kind of establishing, you, you know, you are already connecting with a community on Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is um, to, uh, as a sort of, uh, to talk about your scholarship. And, and, and but, but if you're not already doing that, um, I think there are lots of other ways to think about um, building a platform. Um, it could be, you know, scholarly journal articles, um, bits from a dissertation. Um, that you know will establish you as a scholarly voice on that on that subject. Um, it could be um, uh, you know editorials in in local newspapers or community um, uh, places. Um, it could be talking. It could be radio. It could be. Um, I mean, I think, uh, and it could just be one or two, you know, editorials. Um, uh, but but it's. I think it, it's useful uh, to think of. The book is a vehicle for your voice on your work, um, and just one vehicle amongst many. And um, to think of other ways in which people will want to read you on your book because you've established um, some interest in your voice on those matters through any other sort of venue um, while you're working on it. Great, thank you. We have a question which I think is perfect for Archna. Um, is it acceptable to ask a press to contribute to image subventions and the printing of color images? As our art history editor, she knows a lot about this. <laughs> so it is always okay to ask. You should definitely ask, like you, whether you're at the proposal stage or you're already in conversation about the project with the editor, will the press contribute to image permissions um, what are extra costs, out-of-pocket costs for me as the author? Um, different presses will have different answers to that. And so it's important that you ask. In terms of UC Press, unfortunately, we don't have an additional budget for permissions. But something that I've been working on, and I'm sure other presses have something similar, is like a database of grants, um, other funding sources that you may want to look into that I'm happy to share. And work with you. Um, if you have, if you find a place that um, will cover those expenses, but you need a letter from the press or you need uh, a budget from the press, we're always happy to provide that. Um, but it's a good question to ask. Great. And there are a lot of questions about uh, contracts. And I sort of like generally. How do authors get familiar with the contract? What parts are negotiable? How can they negotiate for the rights to certain things? So maybe someone can talk a little bit about the, the contract process. Raina, do you want to field that? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that, you know, the contract certainly is a place where it's a mutual agreement um, that kind of spells out in those legal terms the 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 vision of the project as we've both come to understand it so things like word count and image count and any sort of um av or special components that you're that you have come to an agreement on should be spelled out there um things like if you're expecting help with an index or an advance or any of these kind of special elements also appear in the contract as well as the schedule so those deadlines for delivery of the manuscript, the complete manuscript, the final manuscript, these are all important um, kind of negotiating points with the with the press. Um, I will also say that as academic publishers, we're a nonprofit press and as academics yourself, you know, we're not really in it to make a lot of money. <laughs> and so, so being really reasonable about about what your expectations are with the with the scholarship that you're putting out there and what that relationship looks like. I think, you know, I work in film and media studies and music. And so there's a lot of different language, languages that are represented in those disciplines. Um, and so sometimes I have authors who are writing about Italian film, for example, and Italian film culture, and they really want to maintain the Italian language rights for their books because they feel very um, kind of invested in that community of scholars and feel strongly that they're able to 
perhaps find ways for their work to be translated and, and sent overseas in a way that we might not be able to support on our end. Um, and so the contract is a place where if you know you can negotiate for those kinds of to maintain those those language rights as well. Um, I will also say that most presses and, and UC Press among them have very robust rights departments. And these people go out to international book fairs three different times a year. Hong, we go to Hong Kong, Frankfurt, London, and we're actively peddling rights for our books to get that in, to, to increase that impact and increase that, that reach of the scholarship, which is so much a part of our mission. Um, and so we do have professionals on our end who are actively working to that end. Um, but again, the contract is a place where, um, you know, where all of those expectations are laid out. And it's another opportunity, as Archana just talked earlier, where you just ask questions, ask for what you want, ask for what, ask, ask if something's unclear, ask, and that will open up the doorway to have a conversation. Um, and hopefully you can come to kind of a, a amenable agreement. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing about contracts. When I first got into publishing, I didn't really understand them either. And what it was really a light bulb moment for me is that the author is actually licensing certain rights to a publisher. So they're not um, saying the publisher can do everything. They're saying, you are allowed to publish it in the English language, in these formats, and I'm licensing you the right to act as my agent to sell translation rights. So it's a really, it's a licensing agreement. and. I think it's an, a valuable way to look at what what you're doing with that uh, arrangement. Niels, did you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just you know I saw some questions much earlier about about concern about rights and uh, and I would just say you know whatever the language in the contract and it is negotiable like um, you know Rainer and Tim mentioned, but even even if certain rights have been granted to us, I, I don't think we would ever get in the way of you wanting to publish another you know a piece of the book somewhere else as long as it didn't conflict with. A sale of the book, or or and if you found a you know Spanish language publisher that was really keen on doing it, and we still had the Spanish rights, we would never get in the way of making that happen. And um, we want we we you know so so I, I think there's anxiety about those rights, but it's it's also um, we want we want what you want in the end, <laughs> and um, and we want to help make that happen. Maybe because someone could speak, there's a question about what's an advanced contract versus a full contract. Kate, you're nodding. Do you want to feel yeah. that? So, so both contracts are the same. And this is a, something that confuses a lot of people. And the reason why I smile about this is I, I took a phone call this morning, or not this morning, uh, earlier this week, I had a meeting with a prospective author. We met for 30 minutes and then they mentioned, I have an advanced contract with another press, but it's just an advanced contract. And I had to explain to them, no, you're actually under contract with that press. And when your manuscript is finished, you need to turn it, you need to submit it to them. I can't, I can't send it out for review because you're already under contract. An advanced contract, though, generally in the lingo means that you are put under contract before you have finished writing the book. So usually that's based on a proposal and a couple of sample chapters that have gone out for review occasionally in circumstances with a very senior author, it might just be a proposal only. Um, and then the only difference in the contract is you have an additional deadline to turn in your full manuscript to go out for full peer review when you're ready. Yeah, and I would say that the advanced contract, there's also a perception that it's an advanced contract because um, the press reserves the right not to publish it. So that is the case where a press it may not make it through the peer review process. It may not make it through the faculty review process. I mean, those things happen rarely, but if that's the case, then the press is under no obligation to, to publish it because it hasn't um, met those milestones. Again, it has to be delivered on time. Although I have to say in the university press world, there's a lot of flexibility around deadlines. <laughs> um, we're often publishing books that are quite late, but I'm not gonna encourage that. <laughs> um, I feel like we're getting near the end. Um, Teresa, how much more time do we have? I'm losing track of time. We have another 10 minutes. Um, oh, okay. More questions. So we have a, a question about um, how long does it take a book from the finalized book manuscript to the publication date when people can actually buy that book? When will it be on sale? And how long does that take? Archna, do you want to field that? Sure. So um, it, varies from press to press. 
So you should definitely ask um, at the beginning of the process, especially if you are under tenure clock, if you have a specific pub date in mind. Um, at the press, generally our books take eight to 10 months, but it does depend on the complexity of the book. And by complexity, I mean, how many words it has, how many images it has. More words, more images means longer time in production because it just takes more time to copy edit and um, lay out those images. Um, the exception to that rule is the art list where most of our books, because we do produce them in full color, they take about 12 to 14 months to come out. Um, I should also mention that the global pandemic that we are all continuing to live in has definitely affected um, you know, the time for shipping and printing as I'm sure everyone here has heard about. And so that's something to definitely check in with your editor about um, and continuing to check in uh, once the book moves into production, just so you have a sense um, of when a book will actually come out. So a question about um, um, peer review, just, just jumping in. So that, that eight to 10 months does not include peer review, that the eight to 10 months is after the, the reviews are done, revisions are done. You've, you know, we, we're putting a final, final manuscript bibliography art program, everything into production. Um, so yeah. And the peer review is the hardest part of the process to calculate a timeline around. We're dependent on, you know, a lot of you to <laughs> provide peer review, and and we depend on the, the timelines that people can give us and. People have difficulties and sometimes don't deliver and it can extend the peer review process. So that is the hardest uh, phase to predict a concrete timeline around. Um, there's a question about, uh, it's related to the developmental editor question, but it's more about the acquisitions editors. What do you all do in terms of editing? Do you help improve a theoretical framework or clarify the argument along the way? At what stage does that happen? At the proposal stage with a couple of chapters? Raina, do you wanna to respond to that? Sure, happy to. Um, <clears throat> so I feel like my, my, the moment at which I get real deep, deeper into the project is at the proposal and the sample chapter stage. Um, this is kind of when we're thinking about, um, we're kind of setting the vision for the entire book. We're looking at things like, um, organization, larger structures, concepts, things of this sort. Um, and we're starting to have those preliminary conversations about packaging of the book, right? What is the table of contents going to look like? Um, how is the reader going to experience the arc of the book? Um, these are places where I, where that's where I kind of lend my, um, uh, my services. You know, I publish in music theory, musicology, film theory. I'm not a, an expert in all of those. So that's why I mobilize my my um, my people in peer review, my, my, the scholars that I've worked with, your colleagues, the people that are in the discipline that are doing the work. The peer review process is really where the content is vetted, the scholarship is vetted, and I view my role as helping with the execution of all of that. So what are the places that need to be filled out? What are the places that can be trimmed? Um, these are the places that I think um, uh, a good editorial relationship can really shine. Um, and so I hope that helps answer the question. Yeah, that's great. So we've had some questions about um, open access. And so I'm going to actually turn to Raina again, who um, coordinates and leads up some of our Luminos uh, from the editorial side. So. Um, how does the, just in broad brushstrokes, how does the UC Press open access uh, program work? Yeah, great. So the open access program, um, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's the idea behind it is, is a different mode of platform. It's a different platform for consuming content. It's a different mode of access. It certainly doesn't lend itself to every discipline out there. Um, some historians, art historians, for example, who really prize that, that object, that physical object of the book or the really high res images and image quality might not come to an open access publishing platform to publish their work. But this is a way in which we can get scholarship out there in a much, um, wider and more accessible way. So it's it's the digital the digital project is considered the primary object and it is free to anyone in the world. Um, they can access it on various different interfaces um, on all digital products, JSTOR, 
views, all of these areas where, where people are going to find scholarship anyways. Um, and it's free. The print product, there is still a print product, um, and that is available at a small price point. But the idea is that um, while it maintains the same integrity of all of our scholarship that comes through UC Press, the integrity of our imprint, it goes through peer review, faculty board, receives good copy editing, et cetera. Um, it it is, is meant to kind of break down some of those, those financial barriers that institutions around the world might be facing. Um, I've seen a lot of really exciting metrics come out with this for people who are working, for instance, um, uh, it, who are studying different cultures around the world, who are working in policy or industry studies where they want their work to be legible and accessible to people outside of the academy. And we're seeing that the, the, that the numbers are really showing good results. Um, so whereas a monograph might sell you know, 500 to 1500 copies in its lifetime, um, these open access books are, are receiving way more downloads um, uh, than, than, we've, than we've seen across traditional publishing. So it's, it's an exciting new world. There's a lot that's happening, uh, it's in flux, um, but it's something that I think California is, is being at the, at, the, at the front of it is, is, is in a really exciting place to be. I think we feel that the majority of the questions and I want to give time to just thank everybody for to thank Teresa and Judy for organizing this panel and thank you for the authors who were on the earlier part of the panel who just it was so nice to hear from that context um, and thank you to the UC Press editors for for coming with such great presentations and answering so many questions so Teresa and Judy I didn't know if you had other comments you wanted to do to make to close things out I just want to thank you. Um, I wish I had access to all this mentorship when I was starting out as an author. Um, so I'm really grateful for your time and your um, your advice. Um, and thank you again, Teresa, for taking the initiative and start launching the first gen initiative with in Press. Sure. And I should mention that we have a team of people that are really excited and working on the program. So it's not just me. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank everyone and just one last reminder again that we'll be in touch just to, to share the recording next week. And thank you to everyone who attended today. I think there was a question about how widely we can share the videos and I think as widely as possible. Yeah, I, the word out to folks. Yeah, I'll be sending it out to anyone who registered, but we'll also be posting to the UC Press YouTube channel as well. So it's open access to anyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.